Welcome friend. If you're watching this, I can almost guarantee you're gonna be able to get your hands on one of these for free. It's a universal series wound washing machine motor from a junked old washing machine. Now the tricky thing with these is controlling the speed and in this video we're gonna look at different circuits to control the speed right through from a very simplest all the way to an Arduino controlled closed loop system that regulates the speed very tightly. Let's get started. One of the first things to do once you've got your motor is to test out the contacts on it. Now with a motor like this, you can normally just trace and get a very good idea where things go. For example, on this one, there's two red, red contacts that I know lead to this part of the end, which is the tachometer. The brushes here, they have colored wires and you can normally trace them. I will put a table up of the different values you can expect between different contacts or across, say for example, the brushes or across the windings. About three quarters of a horsepower normally, these things, so they really can kick out some good power. Uh, certainly you can use it for various things in your workshop, like a small lathe or a pillar drill or a crazy rotary machine as I've been making in the previous two videos. Let's just do a quick theoretical. If I had a string wound round this shaft, coming down with a weight attached. If we imagine that being the load on the shaft, if I divided that weight by four, so I took three quarters of the weight off and let this pull it up, it would go at twice the speed, theoretically. Now, if we think about that for a second, what happens when we get rid of the load altogether it's kind of almost like dividing by zero and the, the speed of this goes up without theoretical limit, although there is some load on there just from the bearings and things like that. But you get the idea. And what happens is if you connect this directly up to its rated voltage, it will spin so fast that it will kind of tear itself apart and the bearings will be ruined. I'm going to talk through four different circuits. The first one is ridiculously simple. All you're doing is putting a one kilowatt heating element in parallel with the armature, which means a connection goes to both of the brushes. Having this in here means the motor won't go into runaway speeds, but it's not a great permanent solution because you're wasting one kilowatt of energy the whole time. It's good for testing the motor out on the bench though. The second circuit is a triac based circuit and I've got one here that I made in the past and that also runs a universal motor and that's just one in this belt sander. Uh, universal motors are often in these kinds of things. Uh, they're not so usable as a big one like in a washing machine though because they're kind of built into the plastic housing and they're quite undersized so they require lots of fan cooling which is why on tools like this you have noisy fans and especially angle grinders, same sort of deal. Food mixers like this, you can only use them at two minutes or so at a time before they burn out. And that's all because the motors are quite undersized. Let's talk about this circuit then. It's very simple and a version of it is used in the Arduino based system as well. The linchpin of this circuit is a singular power triac. It's a simple semiconductor device that prevents current from flowing unless it's triggered by a current at the gate. If and when it receives that trigger, it'll remain on and conducting for the rest of that half cycle of AC current. Only when the voltage passes through zero or does the so-called zero crossing will it turn off again. By controlling when in the cycle we trigger the triac, we can control how much time the motor sees any voltage. It's this part of the circuit here that determines when in the cycle the triac is triggered. The DB3 DIAC is a clever little device that blocks all current unless the voltage rises above 32 volts and at that point it suddenly turns on and conducts. You can think of the DIAC as a mischievous door. It opens in both directions but only very suddenly and when you're pushing on it really quite hard. In our case when it does open it will trigger the TRIAC and send current through the motor. 
these two capacitors and two resistors and especially the variable resistor VR1 all determine how soon in the half cycle the DIAC D1 reaches breakover voltage and therefore triggers the triac. The remaining components are part of a snubber network which is there to prevent dangerous voltage spikes or transients which could phantomly trigger the triac. I have that same circuit in the pillar drill here. There's the variable resistor. You can control the speed anywhere from pretty much off all the way up to very fast. The difference between this and say the belt sander is that this is actually running from an old treadmill motor that's a 240 volt DC permanent magnet motor and they are much better at speed regulation and when you apply the load it's much less likely to slow down and stall. If we want this kind of performance from the washing machine motor with the addition of just a few components to our previous circuit we can really improve the speed regulation under varying loads. To do this we add in the little transformer TR1 to supply the field windings with a high current low voltage rectified supply. By running it on direct current you're essentially turning it into something of a permanent magnet. In combination with the center tap diodes D2 and D3 are doing full wave rectification to create this DC current. If you had a transformer that didn't have a center tap, you could substitute in a high current bridge rectifier here. You'll notice the live voltage coming from the triac, once rectified, is still going through the field windings as well as the armature of the motor. This isn't strictly necessary and you could attach it straight to brush 1 and 2, but by doing this way you have the benefit of lower starting current and higher ultimate torque. Now that's a really great circuit but when you come to the low speeds, or indeed if you're turning down the speed, what can happen is you get phantom triggers of the triac and you get these little blips of speed that you really don't want. To get around that, what we can do is, and I haven't built this circuit, but it looks very promising. The only difference being the addition of a sensitive triac T2. Just like in the previous circuit, the variable resistor adjusts how soon in the half cycle the DIAC reaches breakover voltage and triggers the triac. This time though, the triac T2 also turns on, apparently sending the gate of T1 a triggering pulse train that keeps it going. On variable inductive loads like these washing machine motors, this is said to improve the consistency of the performance. Again, I haven't actually made this circuit, so I'm not going to go into all the details of how exactly it works. I'll leave a link for further reading in the description along with all the other links. Let's move on to the fourth kind of circuit. This is one that I've just made and it uses an Arduino microcontroller in a closed loop system to trigger that triac. Buying components for this project is fine and I'll leave a link in the description below to all of them, but it's a little bit of a pain to have to wait for delivery. so. Old boards like this really help and you can get some of the more pricey components off them, not that there, any of them are very pricey, but you can get some of the bigger components off old boards like this and that's really useful. So I'm just going to take off some of these now and the way I like doing that is with a hot air gun. This method can be harsh on small components if you linger there with the hot air, but it's great for getting big multi-legged components off. This is the one part that I don't really bother reclaiming. It's just so many different values and you need them so often. Cue ridiculously fast making montage. <laughs> Okay, motor control board with Arduino Nano. There it is. There's the back of it. It's pretty messy because I was making up the layout as I went along from the schematic. 
but I think it worked out okay. Some of the components like the capacitors and resistors I've doubled up to make up the correct value because I'm using sort of podge podge of what I've got. Now this is way more complicated than the previous circuits discussed but bear with me here and I'll go through each part of it in turn. The Arduino itself is running what's known as a sketch and I'll link to that in the description below. The sketch or Arduino code makes use of a PID library written by Brett Buriga. So big up him and also Solius Banzvekius. And apologies if I'm butchering your name. Solius has paved the way here in terms of putting together a working schematic. While I'm mounting this front panel, let me interject just a slight warning. There's plenty of mains voltage and opportunity for death here. I'm going to assume that if you attempt any of this you know exactly what you're doing with mains voltage and just how deadly it can be. It's worth noting that the heatsink mount of the triac is also live voltage so that means your heatsink itself will also have live voltage so don't be tempted to touch it to see how hot it is. Here's Solius's circuit diagram. Let's take a look. It's all centered around the Arduino Nano. Now for clarity, none of the pins are actually linked up. Instead, in the individual sections, the pins are labeled. Let's take a look at the motor control section of the circuit. Just as with our previous circuits, the power to the motor is delivered through a triac. The triggering signal, though, comes from this opto-isolator, which is in turn activated by the Arduino's pin A3. Hopefully, if you understood the previous circuits, this is all making sense to you. Essentially, the Arduino has taken over control of when the triac fires and when the motor receives power. The optocoupler allows there to be an air gap between the mains voltage and the 5 volts the Arduino runs from. The only other new thing here is the Relay K2 which just has the ability to cut power to the motor. The relay is energised by the 5 volt power supply but it's controlled by pin 5 on the Arduino. The digital pin can't drive the relay directly itself, instead an NPN transistor is used to switch the power into the relay. Diode D5 is there just to take care of any transient voltage spikes when the relay is turning on and off. The set speed, which is just the speed the PID program is constantly trying to home in on, is adjusted with this rotary encoder. These are the posh knobs on your stereo that just turn round and round, or in my case I salvaged one from the scroll wheel on a mouse. The schematic calls for the Duino's pin D4 to be connected to the push button part of the rotary encoder. My rotary encoder didn't have this so I used a separate tactile switch which does the same job of turning on and off the motor. The range switch here just selects between whether you're in the fast set of RPM or a slow range. Let's look at the LCD display itself. Despite how it looks, connection to the Arduino is really simple if you have one of these ones with an I2C interface. In fact, all you need to worry about is four connections, two that supply the power and two that connect to pins A4 and A5 on the Arduino. You can ignore the rest. For the PID algorithm to know how much to trigger the triac, we need to know how fast the motor is actually running. If it's already overshot its set speed, for example, we need to know that. Or if a new load's just been applied and the motor is slowing down, ditto, the algorithm needs that information. In this part of the circuit, the LM393 comparator takes the tachometer input, the AC waveform, and turns it into a digital signal that the Arduino receives on digital pin 3. Now I believe the Arduino has an internal comparator on pin 6 and 7 and if you're keen on hacking and tinkering you might be able to use that instead of this part of the circuit. But the LM393 is a very cheap chip and for once I thought I'd go the route already travelled. To properly time the triggering of the triac the Arduino needs to know what time the AC sinusoidal waveform is crossing through that zero point. In the previous circuits that timing was taken care of for us because the DIAC was activated by the waveform itself. In this circuit the AC voltage is rectified by the bridge D2 before being passed through the photocoupler PC817. 
this little chip isolates the microcontroller from mains voltage. A digital signal is sent to D2 of the Arduino using this pull-up resistor arrangement. In my rendition of this I'm using a 2.1 amp 5 volt phone charger to power the Arduino. Pretty much the last thing to do on this is to split up the USB power so we just into two wires coming positive and negative and put that into the board and then I think we're about ready to roll with this. Hopefully that's enough for you to have a good crack at making this Arduino based circuit. Uh, there's loads more information in the description, just have a look at the links there. It's worth thinking about whether you really need the microcontroller to control the motor. If all you're looking to do is control the motor in a fairly straightforward way for a pillar drill or something, I personally would recommend the first or second circuit that we looked at, the simple triac based ones. They're so much simpler and easier to make and you don't have to worry about all the tuning parameters that can be quite tricky to get right. Way back when I was first getting into woodworking and setting up a workshop, I made a wood lathe using one of these machines to drive it and the second triac circuit that I showed you in this video. Certainly wasn't the easiest way to get started and build up tools, but it was very cheap and I learned so much from the experience. And now I can, I know I can drive pretty much any machine, a disc sander, a pillar drill, a lathe, or a crazy multi-machine or whatever it may be with an essentially a free source, a washing machine motor. So if you do have any friends or budding woodworkers or just tinkerers that are looking to get new tools, build new tools, then do share this video with them. I hope this video was useful to you as well. If so, please consider subscribing and hitting that little notification bell. Uh, apart from that, I'll see you in the next video.